Yeah, get it on. Got to get on a choice based on a mandate. Get it on in a very unique show. We're in Tucker Carlson's hotel room <laughs> on the west side. Of course, I won't mention the name of the hotel. Or do you care? I'm leaving fairly soon. Oh, so yeah. I don't mind. It's yeah. actually a hotel I've come to LA my whole adult life, and this is a new hotel. I really like this hotel. Well. I will say that, uh, I'll give you a clue, they named a salad after it, and we're not in Caesar's Palace. No, we're not. So there's only one other salad that's named after a hotel. It has a famous sister hotel of the same name on Park Avenue in New York City at about 50th Street that's still under construction. I'll leave it there. So thank you for inviting me in. It was sort of last minute. I did your show on Thursday. I asked you're going to be in town for a day or so, and you graciously invite us in to I went to breakfast in Malibu at a friend's house among the fabulous people, and it I was there for five hours, so I'm a little late. Excuse me. In L.A., Perfectly the fine. meals just keep going. yeah. I know, that's why we all have to take prescription drugs that were meant for diabetes. <laughs> yes. So uh, speaking of that, that's something I wanted to get your head on, and I should tell everyone the documentary series Tucker Carlson Originals Season 3 premieres this month on Fox Nation, and we'll get into many of the subjects you cover, because I'm assuming these are subjects that are all interesting to you. Profoundly interesting. Your yeah. engagement is that much more involved. And, and and so we'll circle back to a conversation we're having off the air, which is I, I'm profoundly flattered that you use my sort of hang your own shingle, do do what you love to do in a in a place in a space that you love to do it, and you know don't answer to the man uh, approach to broadcasting. Well, it totally changed my life. And as I was, and and then you you mimicked it, and it's been easy and fruitful and and much more easier transition than you probably could have assumed at the beginning. It was an amazing experience. It was 2017 or 18. I was on book tour. I wound up booked on your show and I show I was completely confused to get the directions at some warehouse in the San Fernando Valley and I show up and you have this whole world built that you own and you control and fill with people you like. And then we did the show there, which I loved. I still remember the topics. But the takeaway for me, and I got in the car, and I said to my producer, who's in the car, who's actually sitting about 10 feet away right now, I said, I'm, I'm doing this. This is, this is what the future looks like. And at that point, you know, I'm like pushing 50, and I've been in the same business most of my life, and I keep ascending. Oh, I'm so successful. But I, I wasn't living the way that I wanted to live. And I thought, Adam Carolla has shown me, and I mean this with total sincerity, that you don't have to drive to the center of some horrible city and work in a, you know, drywall-clad cube with drop ceilings with a bunch of people you don't know. Nothing against those people, but, like, you can have your own plate. Like, why wouldn't you do that? And I set about doing that. And I, I looking at your place, now, your place is filled with a, you know, one of your, I'm sure your listeners all know, you're a car guy. And so, you know, the cars are worth more than the town that I grew up in. But... Leaving that aside, it's not that expensive. No. It's not, it's not crazy at, at all. It's like pretty easy to take control of your life, at least when you're in your 50s. I mean, that's I was yeah. older when I did it. but Well, you know, the, the thing that jumped to mind when you're talking about it off the air is you are a creator. You're here to create. I'm here to create. Um, I think people sometimes think, well, you're a broadcaster. No. But you broadcast the ideas you create. Yes. And that's very important to you. And I know you think of yourself as more of a writer of course. than an announcer or a broadcaster. And it made me think, I have been in a lot of recording studios. Now, not broadcasting, but music, musical yes. recording. And every single one I've ever been in has been in a freestanding, nondescript building. But the studio that they record in has... Persian rugs yes. and candles yes. and sculptures, and they're all the same. A very sort of Stevie Nicks kind of gypsy kind of flavor, and none of it is there for the acoustics. It's there for the vibe. And so if you talk, it's never very sterile, you know, carpet squares, drop ceiling with the cork and, you know, no bad track lighting. They do do these things in a way. And then when you say to the person who runs the studio, of course they say, we, we're creating an environment. 
that, that people can create in because that's that's what we're doing here. So using the same notion, why go to the same office building and sit in the same cubicle and try to create? You know, wouldn't you, just like the musician, wouldn't the ideas flow so much better in this environment? Oh, oh. I mean, I have really strong and not that interesting, but heartfelt views on aesthetics and design and environment and vibe and smell and all this stuff. And, you know, not everyone shares my views. Of course, most people probably don't. But I don't want to be around certain environments at all. They make mental clarity really difficult. I believe in quiet. I believe in natural materials. I can't stand drywall or any artificial building products. I like wood. I like wool. I do like oriental rugs, actually, and I have them in my office, and I always have. I like you know, wooden furniture. I like older things. I like things that are familiar and warm and muted and calm. And I like people like that too. I like people who are not guarded. I cannot stand to be around people who check what they say before they say it because it's a signifier of dishonesty and deception and calculation. And it makes me uncomfortable. I can't have anyone like that in my life when I'm trying to write or think clearly or figure out what something means. Not that I'm some deep intellectual. I'm certainly not but I do try to achieve some level of clarity. You know, all these facts are coming at you. What do they add up to? What does this mean? Why is it relevant? Is it actually meaningful or is it not? Those are the decisions that, you know, in the course of my not super interesting little life, I'm faced with every day. And in order to answer them, I have to have honesty, clarity, and peace. And I just don't think there's any office building in the world filled with unhappy office workers that provides that environment at all. And it's not so easy to create, not so hard to create that environment, actually. Right. Well, it is interesting, as you're talking about that, sort of people who are guarded and yes. choosing their words. And I'm I'm like you. The only time you'll see me almost get violent is if somebody said, and this used to happen all the time, like, I got an idea for a reality show. And I go, hit me. And they go, I can't really talk about it because and I'm like, then don't bring it up. Well, dude. Exactly. I hate you now. Uh, that's how I and feel. And also the implication is I'm going to take your half-baked piece of shit idea and go running to some <laughs> studio with it to put my name on it. Right. <laughs> and it's true. I mean, there's a reason that creativity is, is sort of slowed to a trickle in the United States. And that's because the work environments that people spend their lives in are antithetical to creativity. You can't create something unless virtually everything is possible. You need to lift off the top of your head and sort of let things flow in and out. And if you work in an environment like, well, you can say this, you can't say that, how could you ever create anything? And so nobody does. It's not just comedy, by the way. Creativity is the key to all business. It's, it's the key to all progress. It's the key to happiness. And it's the key to living a fully human life. And all of that is impossible in an environment run by an HR department. I don't care how well-meaning they are, how decent they are. If they're telling you, you can't say this, really? I'm an adult man, I'm 53. I think I can say whatever I want, actually, and I plan to, not because I want to hurt anyone's feelings, but because I'm diminished as a human being if I can't express myself. And I, I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Yeah, agreed. And it's interesting. So when you're talking about sort of wood and wool and nature. And yes, you know, getting away from even even just bad lighting oh. is 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 brutal. But no direct lighting in any building that I occupy. Lots of sheet metal and and uh, drywall and whatnot. Um, you know, made me think about a study that came out just recently, and I've been saying this for a million years because I used to do Love Line with Dr. Drew, and really one of the great shows ever, ever. Well, that's why I said it's it. true. <laughs> so. People, the, 25 years ago, literally 25 years ago, people would, kids would call up and go, I'm 15. And, you know, my doctor wants to put me on Ritalin or ser some serotonin uh, reuptake uh. inhibitor. And I would say, how about you try classical music and a walk in nature? Yeah. And, and everyone looked at me like, what is this dumb shit who just walked off a construction site? No. And even Dr. Drew, who's turn the corner on this would say, no, look, people have a chemical imbalance. They need blah, 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 blah. And I'd go, why don't you just try two weeks of walking in nature and listening to classical music and see if your head doesn't quiet down a little bit. And everyone looked at me like I was a heretic. Now, of course, that's what, that's what they recommend is as powerful as therapeutics or, or more so, but it made me worry for kids. I mean, kids, and what they're dealing with today and TikTok and noise and pharmaceuticals and a never-ending 
crawl on the bottom of every screen. They're watching their their wristwatch, their phone, the big, the big jumbotron at home. It's no wonder they're they're all going insane. Well, the pharmaceuticals are the are the biggest threat in my view. I mean, there's there's no doubt that there's way too much noise, too many distractions, too many of them are intentional distractions. In other words, forms of manipulation. I mean, there are a lot of dark things going on. But putting chemicals into your brain that rearrange your brain chemistry, um, you know, while maybe a good idea in some rare number of cases, is insane. And just like macro level, think about it. Let's say, for example, anxiety, which is something that every person feels at one time or another, which is another a synonym for fear. Anxiety. And so the first response of your doctor, your healthcare provider, is to prescribe you something to make it go away, a benzodiazepine, Xanax, or, or some other. Think about what that means. You're feeling anxiety. Why? Because you have a brain chemical imbalance? No. Probably in response to something that in, should inspire fear. In other words, if you said to me, I burned the shit out of my hand on my stove, and I said, I've got just the topical anesthetic that will take the pain away so you can put your hand back onto the stove, you would correctly say, that's insane. My hand hurts because it's a sign from my body telling me to keep my hand off the stove. Anxiety is the same. It is a warning that you are not living in a way that brings you peace. So why don't we just pause for a second and go through how you're living? How are your relationships with other people? Are you drinking too much? Do you have a fulfilling job? Are you getting fresh air in nature? How about sunlight? Are you spending your entire life behind a screen? Maybe that's why you're feeling anxious. None of those factors are ever addressed. Those are the core factors. It is a warning sign. If you're having panic attacks, which many people have had, I have had, that is a sign that you need to reassess how you are living and to medicate it away and not address the cause of it is malpractice. And given what we know now about the side effects of benzos and of all these other SSRIs, all the amphetamines that we hand people in the name of curing attention deficit disorder, all of that, given the downsides of those drugs, in some case, the fatal downsides, it's it's a crime. What we're just, it's actually a crime. And I'm sure you know at this stage people who are addicted to pharmaceuticals prescribed faithfully by their doctors who never check in to see how the patient is doing. They just keep writing these scripts. Like people should go to jail for that. And I mean it. Yeah. You know, in a sort of related subject, and there's a few, I have so many points and so little time, but I feel that when politicians explain that we're living in a racist society and try to convince black people that white people don't want them in their society. And as Joe Biden said recently, a lot of people like to bring lynching back and that kind of stuff. I believe that is a crime as well. Of course I, I think is. you're destroying people. Of course. You're destroying whole swaths of this society and making a group feel like they're unwanted in this society. And talking about well, white both supremacy. Group, both groups. Yeah, well, both, well, both groups. Yeah. Right. It's, it's an insane message in 2023 to peddle to the American people. And it's so irresponsible, but it's mostly gross. Well, I mean, the whole thing is, it's everything about it is shocking to me, including the fact that people put up with it. Yes. I mean, the endless attacks on the whites, and I'm not defending white, but plenty of, in fact, most people who annoy me are white, okay? But to attack any group as a group is by definition like a Nazi move. Like what? Where? What? I can hardly believe it as someone who was born in 1969 and grew up kind of faithfully believing in Dr. Seuss and the core lessons of the civil rights movement that we're allowing our leaders to attack an entire group of people based on their genetics. Like isn't that the one lesson we learned from Jim Crow in the Second World War is that shouldn't be allowed and yet it's the defining fact of American politics. White people are bad. And you sort of wonder, like, why does no one stand up and say, how dare you talk about people on the basis of their race? Like, how dare you? But everyone's too, uh, you're a white supremacist. What? No. Yeah, I, I've said this in the other direction. I've said to a couple of my black friends, when Joe Biden is talking about airlines gouging the citizens of the United States with extra costs for knee room or luggage or whatever. Mm -hmm. And he says this disproportionately affects poor people and people of color. Like you've actually taken poor people, remove them from people of color. Now you have a, <laughs> your own category right. 
meaning Jay Z's getting gouged, right, right. Obama, f- and everyone in Appalachia is getting screwed. Right, and yeah. I. But I do want to say to the black populace. Aren't you fucking insulted by this old man who keeps saying, you know, these uh, you know, black, you know, black business owners are as smart as white business owners. So they just can't get lawyers or accountants right. or driver's licenses. Aren't <laughs> they you, don't have driver's licenses. Aren't that's you, the thing. Aren't you, you're not insulted. <laughs> why aren't you insulted by this? I, I'm black and white. Why aren't why aren't both sides going, what are you talking about? Uh, because everyone's so intimidated. And and I have to say, even now, we're, I don't know how many years we're into this whole get whitey phase of American history and black every black person, including Michelle Obama, is oppressed. Every white person is an oppressor. It's been going on for six or seven, eight years now. What I'm so interested to see is that the racial tensions on a personal level still seem amazingly low. Yes. Like I I maybe I'm just living in a different planet or something, but I never have any conflict with any I deal with tons of people who don't look like me. No one has ever said I hate you white man or pe- Americans are actually sort of happy to get along with each other regardless of their skin color even now, which tells you what a totally decent country it is. People are not that interested in race despite the unremitting efforts of our leaders to make us all hate each other on the basis of it. Yes. And uh, that's my experience. Maybe you're living no, a different. I, no, I, I, I completely agree. The other part of it is, is it's, it, it is a lot like the environmental movement, which is you have the same crowd who is talking about systemic racism and it's baked into the fabric of our society and so on and so forth. The same people are talking about the planet is ending in eight years and the carbon emissions and we won't be able to eat beef and they they lay it all out then they fly privately oh, yeah. and buy a home seaside in malibu like, <laughs> i was there this morning you were there this morning so i've told other people this but i will repeat it i live there as well and pch goes right down the middle there or right at the water's yeah. edge a 2000 square foot home on the ocean side a PCH, meaning where the tide will literally come up and touch the pilasters that are holding on your deck. <laughs> that house is $13 million oh, yeah. for 2,000 square feet. If you would like to cross the road and go 30 feet on the other side of the road, up the hill, I can get you 2,000 square feet for 2.9. Yeah. So if we're going to be engulfed by the ocean <laughs> and the people who live on the ocean are the loudest people about about this subject, then why are they paying an extra $10 million to live closer to the thing that's going to annihilate them? Because it's just a cult. I mean, and at the core of any cult is hypocrisy, and the people who are enforcing the rules don't believe in them. It's a right. ritual they go through in order I, to expiate I get it, but their guilty maybe, consciences. Maybe the same people that are telling us how racist society is, you know, the, the same people... Wouldn't want to live in a 90% white seaside town. <laughs> yes. Or conversely move down to Baltimore. I was about to say, all the systemic racism people need to move to the hood, like immediately, and take yes. the subway to work. Yes. 100%. It should be the law. Systemic racism. Okay. <laughs> Let's take a look at the most recent census numbers and find out who lives in your neighborhood. Oh, it's 80% white in a country that's only 60% white? I think um, by definition, you're a Klansman and you should be required to move to Gary, Indiana and enjoy it. And one word of complaint out of your mouth means the Justice Department is going to throw you in leg irons for racism. I yeah, mean and by the way, Malibu is not 80% white. It's probably 91%. I was throwing in housekeepers. But uh, yeah, oh, in if, that you're in, if you're in, well, if the help counts, that will <laughs> yeah. tilt it in your direction. The other thing I was thinking about when I was thinking about talking to you because I'm always interested in exchange of ideas with you, but I was lamenting this back to sort of kids' help, health, mental health, which is, I said, I was talking to Dr. Drew earlier today, and he's saying all young people are miserable, essentially, yeah. ostensibly. And what's going on? I said, well, here's what's going on. If you lived in this country... For the last 250 years, you were in statue building mode. This country built statues. And if you looked at it like a chart or a graph or something, it'd be 
250 years of nonstop erecting statues. Right. It, civil rights leaders, generals, you yeah. know, whatever, in front of- Our heroes. In front of high schools and in, 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 in sporting, you know, Babe Ruth, you know, in front of Yankee Stadium or, or whatever, libraries. But if you looked at the very last three years, there's a sliver of red when all we did was tear down statues. Of course. How could you be happy- if you lived in this red sliver of our country's history where we were in tear it down mode versus build it up mode. Well, that, and you're absolutely right. The statues are a metaphor for a larger trend where every institution, every organization, every myth, all being destroyed. We're in a purely destructive frenzy. This is the sort of late night mode of teenage drunkenness where you just start breaking windows for the sake of breaking them. Yeah, I always thought about that when people bust up bathrooms. They totally do. I'm like, wait, why destroy a toilet? What's in it for you? Well, but, but that's, that's the, just no, late but so night this drunken. Is, this is why mode. like, I've become interested in theology because there's no answer that you can arrive at rationally, and there's also no evolutionary biological impulse to do that. In other words, destroying things for the sake of destroying them doesn't help the species perpetuate. Right. So there's no actual kind of answer in science for this. There is a spirit of destruction that descends on people. All of us have felt it. I have participated in it personally, where you just feel like I want to destroy something. And if an entire society is seized by that, well, it will destroy itself. And that's what we're seeing now. It's not political. There's there's no political. Even the, the Democratic Party doesn't benefit from castrating its own voters, okay? This is right. like not a long-term plan, you know? Okay, everyone who votes for us go trans. So how's the next generation? Well, there's not gonna be a next generation. So this right. is not like some long-term plan. This is purely a destructive impulse. I think it's a spirit of destruction. And again, I have felt that in myself before when I used to drink, especially late night. Let's break something. Really, why? Who knows why? I don't. didn't know then. I don't know why now but I recognize it immediately. And I really think it's a binary. Either you're on the side that's building things, that's healing things, bringing people closer together, physically constructing things. We don't, state of California can't construct new homes. It, right. That's like a metaphor. That's not saving the earth, actually. Look how dirty it is around us here in Los Angeles. They're not, they're not protecting the earth. They're effectively hurting the people who already live here. It's another form of destruction when you force people to live like rats in this cramped quarters for example, here. So I, there are people who destroy things and make things worse. There are people who build things and make things better. I really want to be on the on the latter team. And I, and I think that is a way better and more descriptive way to divide the battle we're seeing, the destroyers versus the creators. All right, we'll take a quick break. Back with more of Tucker from his hotel room right after this. Hey, it's Adam Carolla. Is your vehicle no longer stopping like it used to? Or does it squeal, shake, or grind when you brake? Don't miss spring brake deals at O'Reilly Auto Parts now through April 25th. You can get 15% off when you buy a set of Brake Best Select or import direct brake pads and two rotors. Brake Best Select and import direct brake pads are engineered for all driving conditions to restore and improve braking performance with application-specific friction formulas, noise-canceling shims, and low-dust operation. Trust Brake Best and Import Direct to deliver better braking. Don't take a chance on your next brake repair. The professional parts people at O'Reilly Auto Parts will help you find the brake parts and supplies you need to do the job right the first time. Stop by your local O'Reilly Auto Parts today or visit online, O'ReillyAuto.com. Releasing material through social media and other streaming services has allowed comedians the chance to ignore the old gatekeeper. It's really quite exquisite. In the old world, comedians relied on TV shows to bring them to a national audience. I was so ugly, my mother breastfed me through a straw. Talk show routines were essential if you wanted to become famous in comedy. I told my kid, I said, someday you'll have children of your own. He said, so will you. But late night shows and network specials don't matter as much anymore. Comedians can release their material directly to a global audience and they can do it online. You've got this weird situation where 
the industry is being run by a lot of people who don't seem to understand comedy. That's a real problem. Nobody can speak their mind and have a sitcom, and now you have a thousand podcasts where a thousand people are speaking their mind. So it kind of blew up in their face. I know it would bother me if I had handcuffs on and another comedian came by and was allowed to say and do whatever he wanted. But those people want the handcuffs. They like it. That's the world they live in. They're legacy media guys. They really don't even understand this world. And you know who's responsible? The lawyers. They always blame the talent and the on-air people. It's the stupid lawyers giving panic-stricken notes, worried about special interest groups, worried about one letter they got, uh, worried about one email, one complaint they got. So what happens is you put talent in a little box and they can't be funny. Their grip was so tight that it bulged out the bottom. And so they created Gutfeld. They created whatever new platforms people are using. And they created all of it because they went so hard. Of course it's going to happen. You had to wait for them to bless you. And now we're figuring out that you can bless yourself. Back with Tucker Carlson and the documentary series, the Tucker Carlson Originals, which um, are very well crafted. I was honored to be a part of one. I hope there's room in other productions for me because yeah, I've always you, loved yeah, to contribute. It's like a Woody Allen movie. You're the recurring character in every one. <laughs> um, so we were so we we're talking off the air, but also on the in the here, here's an interesting. Um, hypothetical for you in, in terms of building. Yes. Because I agree, I was a builder, I worked with builders, and they built this country, but it's more than iron and brick and mortar, it's kind of a mindset, yes. you, you know what I mean? Like they want to create, they want to expand, they want to move forward, and so on and so forth. And something else I was kicking around the other day is Los Angeles is, Fallen off a cliff. I mean, yeah. it is it is a hellscape now. It's garbage everywhere. It's crime everywhere. It's everything's expensive and this, that, and the other. And so, we had an election to see who our next mayor would be several months oh, ago. Oh, I noticed. And we had a builder named Rick Caruso, and this guy was a world class developer, and he did the Grove, and he did many of these great developments. And anyone has been in one of those, it's 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 a little bastion of utopia inside of a dumpster fire of it's civilization clean, it's yeah. safe it's everything else so i think that's the guy i would want running la yes okay but we decided to elect a career politician who has no experience winnie in, mandela in was that her building. name building her name is karen oh Bass. sorry right yes. karen Bass. Right, okay so, so we went with the what i would call i have a category called crazy friend of your mom's mm -hmm. when you were in high school that seems to be who runs Los Angeles, like your mom's craziest friend, yeah. girlfriend when you were in high school, and you went like, who's that nutty bitch with the clamp-on earrings? Yeah. They make policy. Yes. That's all they do, whether it's COVID or permitting or whatever whatever kookiness is going down. Um, but here's a hypothetical, and whether it's Karen Bass or Kamala Harris or even Joe Biden, if you just said, I'm going to hire a headhunter, I need someone to run my company. Now, what would it cost to get Rick Caruso to run your company yes. versus what would it cost to get Karen Bass if a headhunter won out there? Rick Caruso would want $46 million a year and yeah. stocks. Karen yeah. Bass, you could get for $46,000 a year to oh, run your sure. company because she doesn't know what she's Plus doing. Plus paid vacation, yeah. Yeah. You know, one one week a year. I'm just saying, if you put it in those terms, isn't it insane what we do in Los Angeles? Well, but it's not just Los Angeles. I mean, across the oh, country, sure. yeah. all of our institutions, from our big banks, I mean, the woman who runs Citibank is like utter incompetence, one of the biggest banks, and it's a strategically, a, you know, essential bank. Um, does You know, not into banking. Every police department in the country seems to be run by one of the dumbest people on the force, our Congress is filled with utterly mediocre people. The choice in LA was especially stark between someone you would never have dinner with and someone with a long record of achievement. And they always choose the least capable, most destructive person. So what does that tell you? 
the goal has changed. The goal is not making the future better for your kids or grandkids or even preserving what you inherited, which seems like a baseline requirement, right? You get something, don't screw it up. Right. The goal is exactly the opposite. It's to degrade, tear down, to get the least capable. I mean, I see this everywhere. You look at the women's magazines and they pick women who are like physically repulsive to be on the cover, not j- or some dude dressed as a woman. Right. And you're like, wait a second. Not only is this not about beauty, it's the opposite. It's about ugliness. It's about promoting incompetence, ugliness, malice, ineptitude, corruption, all the things we thought we didn't want. Now they are being aggressively pushed to the very top of the society. And so like, what is that? That is the spirit of destruction that I mentioned earlier. And there's no rational explanation for it. There's only a spiritual one, a supernatural one. Like, what the hell is going on? This is civilizational suicide, obviously. Yeah, you know, another thing I was thinking about was making me laugh. Because I know you you and I are on the exact same page with the, what we'll just call affirmative action. Yeah. The, the minority hires. Because my thing is, is look... If you want to hire minorities to work at the airport, I don't give a shit. But when it comes to vice president or running cities or mayor, I, I need competence. Just whoever the most competent totally person agree. is. And there's a there's a, a million different things. One is like Vivek uh, Ramaswamy, yes. I believe. All right. He's got a crazy name and he's Indian and he's 20 years younger than I am. And when he talks, I go, I like that guy. That's how I feel. Because I only care about his ideas. I have no idea what his culture is. I, it doesn't, it's, it's not anything that compares to mine growing exactly. up in North Hollywood. I just want to hear his ideas. That's it's how I feel. The, the notion that we're focusing on his race is the racist part of this equation not the person who's agreeing with just his ideas. But I think we're framing it wrong, and I couldn't agree with you more. I've got nothing in common on the surface with Vivek Ramaswamy, different religion, race, background, from different state. You know, it's like he's from a different business. I don't care. I just think right. he's super smart, and he takes these problems seriously. I would vote for him in a second. I couldn't agree with you more. But what I, I, I think that we are under the impression that what we're seeing is affirmative action which we were told 50 years ago when it started was a way to enfranchise people who'd been historically disadvantaged. I'm actually, I don't think that's a terrible idea. Like as an idea, that's not what's happening. No one's benefit. Like if you said to me, okay, we're going to have this BLM movement and we're going to burn a bunch of your cities down and attack a lot of the things that you believe in and hold dear. But like one third of the population of Baltimore will like learn to read at high school level and get good jobs. You'd be like, that's, you know, I'm not sure I'm for this, but at least someone's benefiting. No black people benefited from BLM. We only got the burned cities. Like four black people benefited. They stole the money and bought a bunch of houses on the west side of LA. That's the total pool of beneficiaries. So there's actually no upside to any of this. And that's why I'm saying it's not rational. It's something deeper is going on. And again, I, you know, don't take any spiritual advice from me because I don't know. But I'm just saying the terms that we've used during the course of our lifetimes to describe what happens in politics no longer apply. It's bigger than that because it's irrational. Yeah, and one of the things I was having a laugh about is on Thursday last week, and it was the Trump indictment day, so it was good for uh, Mark Ridley Thomas, who is uh, black. He's the first black man ever elected to L.A. County, the L.A. County Board, right? So he was like the first, right? So he just, he got indicted because he was laundering some money. And he, so I was like listening to the story on the radio. So Mark Ridley Thomas, first black man, L.A. City Board, is laundering money through uh, Marilyn Flynn, who's the former dean of USC School Social Work, first woman, first <laughs> social worker, the first. So I was like, okay, you have the first woman at USC, and they'd have the first black man, and they're fucking their constituency. Of course. What is this notion of, well, if we could only get a woman in this position? You know, when we start putting women, when we start putting people of color and black men in it, then, then what? They're not going to act like politicians and people. But that- also, who benefits? Do I mean I? You know, I haven't been to the Inland Empire recently, which I think is heavily black now. Didn't used to be, but it is because I think a lot of 
black people who lived in LA have been moved east. That's what I've read. Um, and I haven't been there recently, but I would be shocked if there are like a lot of black people in the state of California who are actually benefiting from any of this crap. Nothing. Like none, none. Right. In fact, there seems to be even more suffering, I have noticed, in black neighborhoods. So on what grounds can we justify this? Only on the grounds that it's good for the new generation of Al Sharptons who's continuing the same <laughs> shtick in an effort to do the same thing, which is commit corrupt acts. That's exactly, I mean, why does anyone say this? Like, I, since, I, since when doesn't know. Karen Bass speak for black people? I don't. You know, I don't think she does. Works. I don't <laughs> think she does either. I mean, what? Well, the other, I, you know, I think it's worse than does nothing for black people. I think it's worse because I feel like a lot of this was meant to satiate. Of course. So you go, we're going to have the first black or African-American vice president, whatever. So rejoice black women who are living in squalor outside of Gary, well, Indiana, exactly. right? And, and and it'll do nothing for you. But yet there'll be a moment where it sort of satiates. It's it's like you're rooting for a team to win the World Series or win the Super Bowl, and then you go back to your horrible factory job and your loveless relationship. I've got I've got great news, Adam. It's Christmas morning, and I want to give you not an actual president, but a symbolic present. Here's a symbolic victory for you. <laughs> we, we passed us. Right. I will say this, if I can just make one <laughs> prediction. So the United States is becoming non-white. Everyone's excited about it. Or whether you're not excited about it, not, it doesn't matter. Whites are going to be in the minority. So what that means soon. So what that means is you're going to get at some point, probably in my lifetime, people standing up and, and saying, I represent white people. I'm the candidate of the white voter. Right. And I just want to say on the record that I'm going to tell that person to fuck off because nobody speaks. I'm, a, I'm an adult man and nobody speaks for me because he shares the same skin color as me. Like I just reject that entire idea. If I agree with you, I'll let you speak for me. And if I don't, I won't. But this idea that someone of a certain skin color, any skin color or any ethnic background speaks automatically on behalf of all people who share that skin color or ethnic background is a Nazi idea, and I'm totally opposed to it. And I will be opposed to it when it happens to me. When somebody, and this will happen. Someone's gonna, oh, white people. And I'm gonna be like, I don't even know you, dude. Yeah. I don't even know you. I refuse <clears throat> to allow you to purport to speak for me because we look the same, period. Well, this is the real white privilege. Mm -hmm. It's not having a spokesperson. It's not oh, having- Oh, that's so deep. That's so deep. Sorry, I'll let you continue. I've never thought of that. I love that though. <laughs> I've said it many times on my podcast, which is there is a white privilege. It's not being involved with a group. <laughs> it's right. That's so good. <clears throat> when Joe Biden says, if you don't vote for me, you ain't black. That's a lot of pressure. <laughs> As a group, now we have to vote for a crazy old man who has a corrupt family, or we don't get to be black anymore. This is a this is quite a crossroads. You know what I mean? Really is. I I mean, it was literally. I mean, I know it sounds insane, but it it it. it no, that's year, a brilliant point. That's a well, brilliant years point. ago, uh, David Allen Greer was pulling black comedian was pulling his Ford. Uh, no, Cadillac Escalade, something onto a lot, you know, and there was a black security guard who would kept, kept making fun of him for not getting rims on his yeah. SUV. Fair. And, and why aren't you rolling with 22 inch dubs? Spinners, By the way, yeah. I, there is, there is no land with more potholes in it than Los Angeles. You put on 22-inch rims with 25-series rubber band tires on it, and you will be pulled over by the side of the road with a flat tire every 100 feet in Los Angeles. It makes no sense. The whole point is, look, I could talk about stopping distance and, and, and slalom <laughs> speed and stuff like that, but the point is, is he got a bunch of shit and would continue to get a bunch of shit from a security guard telling him what rims should be on his car and I bet as he pulled up to that lot, he would hope that security guard wasn't there because he was going to get a ribbing for not getting rims exactly. on a lease Denali. Our white privilege? Never have to have that discussion. <laughs> so I'm like, why aren't you wearing a cardigan? <laughs> you know that's what we wear, Tucker. Where's your pocket square? Right. You haven't quoted Seinfeld this hour. What's wrong yeah, with you? What's wrong with you? <laughs> why aren't you listening to Dave Matthews? <laughs> 
Okay, that's good. You got the fifth dimension coming out of those speakers. <laughs> this is an outrage. I complete. I I don't know why I've never thought of that, but it's it it is. It's a privilege I hope to continue having. By and the way. you get to go, whoever. Uh, Ted Nugent, fuck that guy. I don't agree with him. Joe Biden, fuck that guy. Right. He's an idiot. I don't have to pretend. I totally agree. Think about the pressure. You know what I mean? It's oh, like, hey, that. hey, uh, Michelle Obama, what do you think of Kamala Harris? Uh, 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 uh. You know, she can't go fuck Oprah. I don't, <laughs> I don't share any opinions with that cow. <laughs> I bet she thinks it, though. But all I do is shout out white people whose names, who who I hate of course, all day long. I totally agree. The funniest thing is when I, when we first. I'm sure she hates her, but my point is she can't say anything. That's her group. She can't get outside And it. it's so funny that the, the white people, and it is mostly white people, I, I have to say, who enforce, you know, message discipline in this country, mm -hmm. use black people in order to do it. And when we first started this show, like seven years ago, we started to get it. You're a racist. And I, I remember thinking, and even talking to my producers about it, I've got a lot of a lot of bad attitudes about a lot of things. I've never really been a racist. I'm from Southern California. That like, wasn't a thing, right? Growing Scared up. of people look different than <laughs> you. <laughs> right? I just, like, I do have bad attitudes, but they're not really around race. So I was like, why are they? And, and then, then I wanted to say, and so, but I really thought about it because I, I don't actually want to be a racist. I don't like racism and much less a white supremacist, whatever that is. So I did think about it at some length. And I thought, actually, I'm not, there are not really many black people I'm mad at. The people I'm mad at, if I have a sight picture of the people I'm mad at, it's 45-year-old private equity wives who yell at me in restaurants. It's like a very, you know, it's like middle-aged female white lawyers. They really hate me. I don't know what that is. Maybe it's a function of the legal education or something, but they really don't like me. And so I wanted to say, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm actually not mad at black people. I hate you. Right. I mean, you're the one I really dislike. And I mean that. And if you could x-ray my soul and see who I'm actually mad at, that's who I'm mad at. But they'll, but they they don't want to hear that. So I know you're really mad at black people. I'm I'm actually really not, just being honest. Well, how how could you be mad at an entire group? when they're, they vary so I don't greatly. think 45-year-old private equity wives at the Four Seasons in Jackson Hole vary that much. Oh, well, they don't. They don't. Yes. There's not a lot of, no, they're all kind of the same. They all have the same attitudes. And I happened to just have been there two weeks ago, and one of them snarled at me. as I was on my way to the men's room, and I was like, oh, I know who you are. You have a weak husband who you have. You despise right. and have contempt for. Did she but that's say, not my fault. Did she say something to you? No, she took pictures of me and snarled. <laughs> um, and I wanted to say, I don't know you. We've never met. You know, I know that you live in Santa Monica or wherever, Greenwich, Connecticut, but I know for a fact that you have contempt for your husband. And I think if we could sort out the problems in your marriage, your politics would probably improve pretty dramatically. Yeah. Might be angry at the stepdad, too, growing up. For sure, the stepdad. But at this level, it's almost always the absent husband who's always in Hong Kong, and she knows He's cheating on her, and she's getting mad, and he doesn't want to deal with it and listen to her. She's like, oh, I'm going golfing. And then she sits and goes on the internet and, like, reads Twitter and gets mad about the oppression of people she's never met. What is it about you that provokes that reaction? Because I'm from that world. That's why. That's exactly what it is. That's exactly – because I know them because I grew up around them. It's a very specific group of people who I've spent my entire life with, and I'm on to them. I know exactly who they are. I know exactly what motivates them. And and they know that I know, and so that's why they hate me. I'm just being honest. I mean, I honestly think that. I've never been yelled at by anybody's housekeeper or any cab driver. The only people I've ever been yelled at are from that world, and it's a world that I'm from. So it's like, yeah, okay, honey, I know who you are. Oh, it's that's interesting. Oh, it's totally true. Ask them, some of my producers are in the room, and they're nodding because they travel with me. It's always that. It's always 100% that. And and that, so I'm like a trader or something, and I'm from Washington. You know, I spent my whole life in Washington, and like they're all super mad at me because I watch them go insane. I watch Trump, whatever you think of Trump, call bullshit on a bunch of their different longstanding scams, particularly in foreign policy. And when Trump said, "What's the point of NATO?" and they called him a racist for asking, I was like, "Oh, wait a second, you hate him because he's calling bullshit on your schemes, and you don't have a good answer. You can't tell me what the point of NATO is. What is the point of NATO?" I'll listen patiently as you explain. Oh, well, uh, shut up, racist. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's your answer? You know, so I- You just sounded like someone doing an impersonation of you. 
No, your, your well, but, last five seconds. Okay, but it's just heartfelt. I mean, like I, I really feel that way, and I was there, and I saw it. I know I worked for Bill Crystal for six years. I know how this works. So yeah. I'm not guessing, and I, they really hate that. I also have a theory, which is you outrage these people by not caring, and that drives them. Well, I have no respect. I have no respect. There's not one person who writes for the Atlantic magazine whom I consider impressive or smart. Not one. And they're all caught up in, well, you know, I'm a fellow at the Atlantic Council writing for the Atlantic magazine. It's like, I know what that is. Like, you're not going to bullshit me into respecting you because I know how deeply mediocre you are. You merit badge collector. You're a total fraud. You're a complete fraud. You lived on my street. So I am not impressed by you, not even a tiny bit. And they don't like that. Yeah, they also think that you're supposed to cower in fear when they wag their finger at you. And no. especially the things like the race card. Ooh, for them, that's, that always works for them. Yeah, and that no. can shut every detractor up. If and I were a racist, it would work on me, but I'm actually not. And so I'm not guilty about it at all. Yes. And, you know, if they ever attack me, on things that I, you know, I have I do have some bad attitudes about things. Mostly I admit them. But if they ever attacked me on something I was guilty of, they would shut me up. Right. If I was, like, cheating on my taxes and they're like, you cheat on your taxes, I'd be like, oh, bro, I don't cheat on my taxes. But calling me a racist, like, I'm actually not a racist and I'm not, my, my views are, I'm not embarrassed of my views at all. I don't think I should be. I'm not. I'm happy to tell you my views on race. I don't think they're embarrassing. I think they're right. And they're certainly not rooted in hate. They're rooted in a fundamental belief in the moral equality equality of people. And I say that all the time. They don't care because they think they can shut me up by calling me a racist or a white supremacist or a Nazi. They're literally cataloging the race of every person in the United States and rewarding some and punishing them others, punishing others, and they're calling me a Nazi. <laughs> really? Okay. Um, so, like, yet they have no power over me whatsoever. None. No, I, I agree, but it's interesting that you are a caricature, a sort of cartoon caricature to the other side, which I realize is part of not being able to articulate constructively opinions and views and debate, which is to say, um, I disagree with the Obamas, but I don't ever say they're bad people. I just would disagree with their policies, right. you know, and I would feel the same about, I don't know, John Kerry or, or uh, even um, Bernie Sanders or something. I would right. never say he's the devil or he's Hitlerian or he's a racist or misogynist or anything. I'd just go, here's a guy with bad ideas yeah. that I disagree with. Um, but you do not get that same respect. No one says, I just disagree with Tucker Carlson over policies. They call you every name in the book, and they'll do that with anybody they disagree with, which says to me maybe they're out of arguments. Well, they're certainly out of arguments. And in fact, they, to the extent they have arguments, they won't you know, unfurl them. They're always welcome on my show. Anyone who disagrees with me who's in a position of decision-making authority is always welcome on the show, and I mean that. I have no problem sitting down for an hour with any of these people. We always invite them. They, they are all Chuck Schumer. We've invited him how many times? Dozens of times. Shut up, racist. Okay, got it. Um, you know, they they don't want to debate. Their arguments don't have popular support. They try to assassinate my character. I don't hear most of it because I never Google myself. I've never read my own Wikipedia. I don't go to you know places where they congregate in general. I'm not welcome there. And that's fine with me. I'm just, I'm also middle-aged, you know, I'm out. I don't care what they think. And I really mean that from the bottom of my heart. I, I hope it's evident. And I feel like they don't have a leash on me. And I do think at some point they'll probably figure out a way to get me. And if I ever get caught with, you know, a quarter pound of heroin in my truck or kitty porn on my computer, you'll know that they've gotten me. You know, if they accuse me of some crime, I'm just telling you now it's not real, but whatever. The... But until then, I'm, I just don't care because I don't think the people who call you a Nazi when you're arguing against the Nazi position, as I always have and always will, I don't think they're arguing in good faith. I don't think it means anything. It's dogs barking. It's just not relevant to me at all. 
All right, we'll take one more break. Be back with a little more Tucker Carlson from his hotel room right after this. Uh, let me tell you about the, the Jordan Harbinger Show, a different kind of sponsor for this podcast. It is the Jordan Harbinger Show. If you like fascinating podcasts and interesting people, then you should definitely check it out. There's an episode for everyone. No matter what you're into, Jordan talks to Scott Adams about persuasion in a world where facts don't matter or you go inside the dark world of wildlife trafficking. You'll always find something useful to apply to your own life, like routine changes to boost productivity or slight mindset tweaks to change how you see the world. We enjoy the show. We've had Jordan on a few times, been on this show. He's been on me and Drew's show a few times. We know you're going to as well. So it's the Jordan Harbinger Show. That's H-A-R-B as in boy, I-N as in Nancy, G-E-R. And you find it on Apple Podcasts and uh, wherever you listen to finer podcasts. It's the Jordan Harbinger Show. Tucker Carlson speaking truth from the 11th floor of his beautiful hotel room. (laughs) Palatial is the word I'm yeah, searching for. I uh, now here's another thing I was thinking about. So sorry to keep referencing him, but I had a, a long conversation with Dr. Drew today, and he said uh, pot is really fucking kids up, yeah, like young people up. Like pot is really bad, and it's powerful, and it has having effects. And he, you know, I'll leave the details out, but he told me a few stories that were affecting his life, and I said, you know, Drew, we have been turning pot into some like movement over the last several years it's a drug fine i'm not uptight if you want to smoke pot smoke pot but it's not a multivitamin it has effects and you wouldn't want your 14 year old doing it and you wouldn't want your adult son doing it every day that's that's for sure and i said you know this is uh we had some off the air some hot nicotine talk I said, you know, Drew, most people who live in Los Angeles, certainly if you polled mothers who live in Santa Monica, California, they would much rather their kids smoke pot than smoke cigarettes. And they would much rather their kids smoke pot than vape. And I thought, all that is is water vapor with nicotine in it and maybe a little cherry flavoring and some cartridges. But that's how off the rails we are. Pot is screwing up kids. It's screwing up adults. It's damaging a generation who participates in it regularly. And we've declared, in California, we've declared war on nicotine and not THC. It, it, I'm never not shocked by the deep ignorance of the educated class. Yes. Some of the most ignorant people I've ever met are graduates of prestigious colleges. That I'm not saying that to be counterintuitive or to attack the ruling class forever. I've just noticed it because I've lived among them my whole life from birth till now. So yeah, they have no idea what they're talking about is the truth. And um, and they're very credulous. They'll believe anything the authorities tell them. And it's you can't have a leadership class like that. I mean, that's what, what you just said. I'm not going to bother to like, the science behind what you just said is pretty transparent. It's available on the internet. Most people have internet connections. The connection between chronic marijuana use and schizophrenia is much higher than the connection between chronic LSD use and schizophrenia. I stopped using LSD as a child because I thought, wow, I, can't, I don't want to get, I had a friend who got schizophrenia from it. I was like, I can't do that. I just read yesterday, there's a higher correlation between smoking weed a lot and getting schizophrenia, which is an incurable, it's worse than pancreatic cancer. It'll destroy you. Mm-hmm. And we've all seen it. And marijuana, like What? Whereas nicotine, of course, especially if you remove the tobacco from it, is not a carcinogen. And in fact, it's an enhancer of mental acuity, among other things. So whatever, I'm not even going to make the case for nicotine. I'm merely going to say if you believe that marijuana is less a threat to your kids than nicotine, you're ignorant. Like you don't know what you're talking about. And yet you probably went to Stanford and like you work at some VC firm you know what I mean? Or you're a lawyer in Century City. It's like, how do we wind up with people this ignorant running the country? I mean, I saw people on the street today in Los Angeles. It's a beautiful day. It's April 1st on the way out to the PCH on San Vicente wearing masks outside. And I said to my producer in the car, wow, there's a lot of mentally ill people here and they're not all homeless. Some of them have expensive shoes on. 
But then I thought it's not, and of course it is, you are mentally ill if you're wearing a mask outside on April 1st in Los Angeles, 2023. But it's also a failure of education. Like they just don't know. Well, how do the supposedly most informed people in the richest country in the world just not know basic science? Like superstition has supplanted evidence and science to such a huge extent that I, I spent half my life in a very rural, very rural community, a town of 100 people. And most of the people there have high school diplomas if, if no one went to college. And I would say they're better informed on like science than most people in Brentwood. That's crazy to me. Yeah, I know. I I marvel. I mean, obviously, through COVID, we just lived through this. Yes. And it's insane. You know, the difference is, is if your rural community of 100 people uh, got the science wrong, it would be fine because they're not making policy well, decisions. That's right. So we have the sort of... I I. I believe it's a lack of religion and it's of course and, it is and it's place superstition and and you know if you just think we should all look back on this era and think about this phrase mask up in between bites the notion yeah. that that was even uttered from a mouth much less a, a mouth of authority into a microphone or into the galley, you know, into the alleyway of an airplane at the beginning. The idea that somebody just said mask up in between bites and we listened is is in it's it's insane. The, the Manson family is not as insane as the person I, that I came agree. up with mask up in between bites. And they had more sex than your average <clears throat> and a, probably healthier sex lives than your average. The Mansons, for sure. You know, yes. leader of our society now. They're all weird, androgynous, celibate, creepy, isolated people who are encouraging children but to the, be androgynous and celibate and isolated. But the, it's the, like, Whoa, it's, whoa, it, but the, I'm opting out, dude. This is too dark it's, for me. But it's self-imposed. Oh, yeah. And that's the crazy part. Yeah. You know, when I used to work on a construction site with poor people, they ate crappy food for lunch, but it's all they could afford. Yeah. But this is self-imposed. 100%. And that's the part that I can't square. Well, it's people aren't meant to live in a world like this. I mean, yes. it's just too nerf a world, you know, yes. there are no, it's just, it's not, there's so many problems, but I would just say, as we were talking about with SSRIs and benzos, it's like, if you're having this reaction to the to your life, you need to change your life. You need to change your life. It's not that it's not, it's cause and effect. I feel like we're losing an understanding of like the core of reason and empiricism, which is cause and effect. You do this, that happens. This takes place. Here's the result. If you are going crazy, you should assess not your brain chemistry, some crackpot science. It is crackpot science, by the way. It's bullshit. They don't know that. It's right. all made up and encouraged by the pharma companies. Don't. It's not a problem with your brain chemistry, most likely. I mean, unless you've had a stroke or some neurological problem. But no, it's you're living an unfulfilling, lonely life with no meaning. So why don't we attack that? And then we'll all be better. I'm serious. Like the number of childless, unhappy, celibate, androgynous leaders we have is crazy. If you went to Gretchen Whitmer's dinner table and no one was around and assessed her life, like you would, you would look into the pit of spiritual hell. Like you know that all these people lead totally unfulfilling lives. Like you don't want people like that in charge. You don't. You want rounded, happy people with rich rewarding personal lives and deep enduring personal relationships. They're the wise people. You don't want crazy people with no kids who don't give a shit about tomorrow. You don't want 80-year-old people who are literally staring down the barrel of death, making long-term decisions for a country of 350 million people. That's not a good idea, dude. Let's not do that. Yeah. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up Jacob Ch Chasley. Chasley? Chansley. Chansley. Yeah. I miswrote that down. And so the, the uh, QAnon shaman, Chewbacca man, I think they yeah. called him back in the day, who uh, became the face of the insurrection, uh, that uh, we won't pour over the nuts and the bolts of January 6th, but <laughs> the idea that... Uh, 
I can't even talk about it, Adam. The sick Nick was killed with a fire extinguisher yeah. that he was killed with. I'm getting bear PTSD, spray. dude. I'll never, I'll never. Uh, people that killed themselves months later were accounted amongst the police that were killed that day. I mean, it, it, first off, as I, I've said many times, when there's an actual catastrophe, yeah, an actual thing, you don't pad the numbers. No. Nobody said. 10,000 people died on 9-11. Or 10 said, million. Or 10 million. They just went <laughs> 2,963 or whatever. Or at Pearl Harbor or exactly. at anything. That's just like when there's an actual event, commercial airliner crashes. Yeah. 287 souls. Why are you padding things? Why are you trying to make rock soup out of this event if it was just the greatest insurrection and not since Pearl Harbor? So... For anyone listening, if you ever hear them padding things, we lived through it with COVID and you saw it with January 6th, then stop to say to yourself, if this was the event they said it was, why are they counting cops who died six months later? We're watching history be made. Yes. We actually have this weird vantage where we just sort of got led in by accident into the history making factory and we see what they make it from. Yes. And it's not actually like the parts of the cow you want to eat. Right. It's all like buttholes and sawdust and, and right. like they're calling it a hot dog. It's like, it's disgusting the closer you get to the manufacturing process. And it turns out this is not the only historical event they're lying about. And why are they lying about them? Well, they're lying about it because history is not the record of what happened. History is a blueprint for the future. So on the basis of this event, we're going to make these forward-facing decisions. And it's very tempting for people to lie about that in order to justify making changes that they want, which will benefit them. So I guess in me, and I'm interested in history, it does make you kind of reassess, like what are the things that they tell you, like what are the lessons of Vietnam or 9-11? I'll just say one thing. I'll never forget sitting on the set on Crossfire more than 20 years ago after 9-11, and I said something like, and I was upset about 9-11, went over to the Middle East to cover the aftermath, all this stuff. I, I had very conventional views on 9-11. I don't think the government did it. I'm not saying that. But I did ask on the set, like, why do you think 19 people killed themselves? I'm not defending the hijackers. I think they're monsters. They're terrorists. I still think that. Of course they are. But like they did die. Like why? What was their motive? Like you have to believe in something really strongly to want to kill yourself for it. What was that thing? And I just asked that question. I still don't know the answer. By the way, 20 years later, I have no freaking idea what the answer is. But I said that. I mean, I've never been attacked like that. Shut up. Are you on the side of the terrorists? No, of course not. I, I live in Washington. I, I was there when the Pentagon blew up. Like I'm not for this. I hate it. But I do think we should know why it happened. That was that was the number one impermissible question. And it was at that moment that I was like, oh, wow. If they're not letting me ask the most obvious and important of all questions, like which is why, always the most important question, why did this happen? Then maybe there's a reason they won't allow that to be asked. And maybe the reason is they're going to use this event to change my life. And of course, that's exactly what happened. They used that event to change my life and this country and make them both worse. So we should always be on guard against that, I think. That's absolutely 100% what they're doing with the in, the fake, unarmed, unplanned insurrection of elderly American middle-class voters who had an actual beef with our election system. Um, so, of course, they're lying, and we should call it out constantly, and I've lost a, a, you know almost all my old relationships in Washington for doing that. I don't care. It's true. They are lying, and I'm going to keep saying that until they silence me. Do you think uh, Chansley was released in part because of the video footage you released on your show? I have no idea. I I would, you know, like to flatter myself and say, we got a man out of prison, but he's still in a halfway house. He should not be there. He did nothing wrong. He committed no crime. He was led into the Senate chamber by armed police officers. They, led, they opened the door. They let him in, tried a bunch of doors. They finally found one that opened. And they let him in, at which point he said a thank, prayer of thanksgiving to God for the police officers. So, like— if he committed a felony, how did the cops who let him in not commit a felony too? The whole thing is so insane. They hid that video, the January 6th commission, Adam Kinzinger and the loathsome Liz Cheney and the rest of them. And they put this man in prison and destroyed his life on the basis of a lie. So Liz Cheney went on and got a job teaching children at the University of Virginia. So how does she still have that job? I, I just like, I can't even believe that we all know that they lied, they destroyed a man's life, and no one has been held to account for that. It drives me insane when I think about it, so I, I, I try not to. Yeah, it's, it's also, 
it's insidious that you realize that they will sacrifice people at the altar of their form of democracy. Would you ever do that honestly? Look into your soul. Would you ever destroy a man, throw an innocent man in prison for some material advantage for yourself? Honestly. It's insane. It's unthinkable. You would, it's unthinkable. It's unthinkable. It's, well, it's it's the opposite of being a politician or what you want in a politician. Yes. And I don't get, I mean, I've my wiring, and this is going to sound convenient, but I've, it's been on display many times. Every softball game I've ever played in, when I'm out in the field and the secretary comes up and hits the comebacker to the pitcher, and then there's a tie at first base, and my team is arguing they're out. I always yell, let her stay on first base. Yeah. Like, leave her alone. She barely knows how to swing a bat. You know, <laughs> and Everyone yells I'm at with me. You. Then my own players yell, my team yells at me, shut up, don't argue for the other side. I'm like, just... I, 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 it looked like she beat out the throw. That's all I'm saying. And then they go, shut up, because they want you to argue their point, whether right. they're lying or not. No, imagine being on the January 6th committee, knowing what actually happened, having access to this footage, and just going along with this. It's, it's unthinkable. Well, people who would do that would do anything. They would necklace you. I mean, they would they would literally necklace you in the street and scream, no one is above the law! <laughs> I mean, what? I mean, it's like so... You can't have people like that in power. You can have yeah. people who disagree with me. You cannot have people who are willing to punish the innocent and destroy the innocent for the sake of whatever scheme they're running. You can't well, have people I, like that. I think if you got them drunk, they would say, look, you would throw away a couple of lives in order to prevent this greater evil that's how they just taking over themselves. this country they that's, how they that's how they that, do that that's 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 how they there used to be signs in this town that said uh 54,000 people die of secondhand smoke every year and and I used to pass by it and I would say well that's bullshit yeah and I would go into work and I would say to Dr. Drew 54,000 people die of secondhand smoke? And you go, no, nobody dies of secondhand smoke. I go, have you ever seen a patient who suffered from secondhand smoke? He said, no, no. That is a loved one, a celebrity, died of secondhand smoke. You know, I was like, it's like, no, it doesn't exist. I go, well, what are they doing? Go, They're lying, trying to get you not to smoke. That's basically how they work, which is, yeah, this is bullshit, but I know what's good for you. So that, I can, that uh, or AIDS being an equal opportunity killer, work. whatever. It, of course it doesn't work. But it, it degrades what, everyone involved, lying. Who would, who's going to listen to Fauci or Rochelle yeah. Walensky or the head of the WHO or, or Barbara Ferrer, Health Council, California, Los Angeles? I'm not going to listen to those idiots about anything. Of course not. Ever again? No, I'm going to be even if they're right. I, I won't be totally, listening. Well, to that's that. the other. That's the the effect, we, of course, right. is to drive people out of the medical system into holistic healers and shamans and crystal wielders and into acupuncture and cupping and like m m most rational people are like, I don't know anything about science really, but I know that you're lying and I'm not going to your office again. Like honestly, people feel that way. Right. So, I don't know predictions i mean where do you think this is going I'll, I'll buy a second which is i always just go safe spaces and octagons i just say if you want to live you're just going to move to florida or you're going to move to you know nevada or you're going to move to texas or you're going to move to somewhere where you're surrounded with like-minded non-nut jobs and san francisco and la can just turn into piles of homelessness and soylent green and taxes up the wazoo and i think people are just going to separate la would be the safe space and florida would be the octagon but the people who want to live their own life and you know want to be free during covid times and things like that are just going to just going to separate yeah i uh, clearly that trend is in progress and if you've been to palm beach or miami recently you'll notice they're building a whole new country there you really? know florida is the capital of a new country it's, it's unbelievable you should take a week and go and check it out I personally think it's very sad to give up the prettiest place in the world, which is where we are now, California. And that the answer is really super simple. It's not even about policies. It's about telling the truth. If you commit to telling the truth as fully as you can, recognizing you probably get it wrong a lot because you're only human, 
but saying what you honestly think all the time, you become filled with some kind of weird power. You become bigger and stronger. But if you submit to lying, if you allow yourself to lie through fear or avarice or whatever your motive, you become smaller and more afraid. I really believe that. It's like the one thing I've learned in the past five years. Telling the truth makes you bigger and stronger. Lying makes you smaller and weaker. And if people just resolve to tell the truth, period, I don't care, I'm telling the truth. I honestly think you could save California. It would probably be a lot more liberal than I am. That's fine. But it wouldn't be dystopian. You could live here. If people just, if normal people, and that's the majority even now of California, normal people, if they just resolve to do that, I think that's the answer. A good note to go out on. The series, Tucker Carlson Originals, uh, season three premieres uh, this month on Fox Nation and all the subjects you're interested in or subjects you weren't interested in, but Tucker is interested in and he will make you interested in it because he does that good a job of executing. And of course, the show, Tucker Carlson tonight, weeknights at uh, on the East Coast at uh, eight. We're lucky we get to see it here at uh, five o'clock. And... Uh, that's on Fox, of course. Uh, thank you so much for carving out time, Tucker. Are you kidding? Thanks for coming to my palatial hotel room. It's beautiful. I feel guilty because you I was- You can't see my piles of room service in the background. I was. I did grab a glass from the mini bar, Yeah. and I was heading to the bathroom to fill it up because I just can't pop the cap on $17 bottles well, I've got of water. 30 pounds of lobsters and six creme brulees coming in just one second. <laughs> All right, well, maybe I will hit the mini bar in that case. <laughs> but your lovely producer stopped me from filling it from the sink. I was actually going to dip it in the toilet. I love that. <laughs> Ladle style. And she brought a bottle from the mini bar. So here we are with my beautiful uh, aqua pana or whatever it is. Anyway, I've spoke too much. Tucker, always uh, always a thrill. Always, uh, Thank always you, glad to talk to you. And until next time, this is Adam Kroll for Tucker Carlson saying mahalo.